How's it going, Dustin? We got a few minutes for class start, so feel free to ask questions if you have any. How's it going, Ron? Pretty good, I'd like to say. Not too bad. Feel free, anybody that has any questions, go ahead and ask them while we're waiting for other people to come in. Uh, Professor Younger, uh, it's yes. me, uh, For somehow, I don't know why. I think my wife last time used it. And, uh, the <laughs> so you're signing in as Amelia? Yeah. <laughs> no problem. I didn't know how to change her name. I was wondering who Amelia was. <laughs> Uh, no problem. I'll keep. I'll make a note of that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So far, it looks like the internet's holding up okay. So that's good. I'm. In a, it's a bit of a storm going on here, off and on. So I'm kind of concerned I might lose connection. Won't go much time now. <laughs> All right, I guess it's time to get started. I'm sure other people come in. So uh, I do a slightly abbreviated version of chapter 20. Uh, you will see, I, I will probably tell you that the best thing to do is make sure you know the examples in the, in the chapter. If you can do all those, you should be pretty good. Uh, that's sort of the bare minimum of stuff, but I'm going to talk about various things. And, and the big thing here is we've got various versions of the second law of thermodynamics, and there's even a third law of thermodynamics. So in addition to having a zeroth law of thermodynamics and a first law, which we've already studied, uh, studied, we also have a second law of thermodynamics in many forms, and then a third law of thermodynamics, which your book mentions as well. Uh, I'll just say as a general rule, if you're taking a course, for instance, like physics, a two semester course, and there's a whole chapter called Newton's Laws, then it's really, really wise of you to have uh, knowledge of Newton's Laws, not only exactly what they are, and not only your ability to completely quote them verbatim, but also to know which one's Newton's first law, which one's Newton's second law, which one's Newton's third law. Same thing with the laws of thermodynamics. You definitely, definitely, definitely need to be able to recite uh, the zeroth law of thermodynamics, the first law of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics, and the third law of thermodynamics. Uh, I would also say included in that is Kepler's laws, which we studied in the 241 course, 
which was uh, the planets orbit the, uh, the sun and elliptical orbits with the sun at one focal point. Uh, the, the planets sweep out equal areas in equal times, and then the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of the orbit. That's Kepler's three laws in order. So just keep those uh, memorized. I don't care if you just write them down every day just to make sure you can keep them in your brain because we often give that as a chucker question, supposedly a really easy question where you might get eight, nine, ten points uh, just for knowing those. And we think we're doing you a really big favor, but I've, in the past I've discovered that sometimes people don't know them. So I just want to remind you of that. And if you look in your book, it goes over the second law of thermodynamics in various forms. So for instance, in the uh, first form, which is the Clausius statement uh, of the second law of thermodynamics, it says heat can flow spontaneously from a hot object to a co cold object, semicolon. Heat will not flow spontaneously from a cold object to a hot object. What they mean by spontaneously, I mean, you probably know the definition of spontaneous, but what they mean is you have to do something else, uh, put in some work, do some some kind of you know voodoo or something to actually force heat to leave a cold object and go to a hot object. So that's the Clausius statement of second law of thermodynamics. Like I said, they'll mention several of them through here uh, throughout chapter 20. So you definitely want to read the chapter and you definitely want to write each of them down verbatim and then memorize them verbatim. What you're going to do is just like when may, hopefully your calculus teacher taught you or required you to uh, memorize the definition of a limit. Uh, that was one of the things we had to do when I went through school. And what, what it helped was I had it in my head memorized so that at random times I could sort of analyze what it was talking about. And I understood the limit concept a little earlier than most people. In fact, our math teacher told me she didn't understand it until she was in her like second or third year of grad school. So I got a little earlier start on that. And the same thing with these principles go, you're going to build your own little ideas about it. But uh, if you start off with these versions, then you'll have a verbatim uh, version that you can look at at any time and mull over in your head to make more sense out of it. So make sure you guys uh, do that. Make sure you have those laws memorized as well as their names. That's why, also why I told you you're allowed to have an equation sheet and I don't mind single word definitions of a given symbol. Like if you had uh, V average equals X minus X zero over T minus T zero, I wouldn't mind you having uh, V bar equals average velocity and X equals final position and X zero equals initial position. Those are fine. But if you write down first law thermodynamics or second law, then, then that's uh, basically making it, you know, making my question that I think is a good freebie question for my students is making it sort of moot. So make sure you don't uh, include whole sentences or names of equations or anything like that. All right, so let's get started. Now, here's the neat thing. It turns out that with the first law of thermodynamics, which I've mentioned to you, is another version of conservation of energy or in the post-relativity realm, uh, it's a version of conservation of mass energy, meaning mass, life and energy, uh, because Einstein told us that there is a relationship between mass and energy that happens to be true all the time. Just remember, anytime energy is released, there's some equivalent loss in mass somewhere, and that loss in mass times C squared is equal to uh, the energy. So that's just something that's in there. So in general, energy slash mass energy slash mass are conserved. So uh, that being said, we now know the first law of thermodynamics and there's nothing in the first law of th thermodynamics that, vi that is violated by the following occurrence. So let's imagine I have a coffee mug sitting on my desk full of coffee and it gets toppled over. It falls down onto the floor, shatters, coffee spills everywhere and everything like that. Well, if you're just using the first law of thermodynamics, it turns out that you could have that complete process completely go backwards, meaning spontaneously the 
uh, coffee and water and sugar and cream mixture that was coffee uh, that's now been absorbed by, say, the carpet or whatever's on the floor, that could spontaneously jump out of the carpet and start to fall back into the shattered coffee mug. At the same time, the bits and pieces of the shattered coffee mug could come together and form a coffee mug that's not shattered, just in time to catch all the coffee. And then the whole thing could leap back up onto the table. And lo and behold, no violations to the first law of thermodynamics has occurred. So uh, it turns out when we watch videos of things uh, played in backwards, we often can recognize something's funny. So we have some sense of what a video run backwards looks like from some understanding of nature. Well, it's such a profound idea that we often call uh, entropy or the second law of thermodynamics times arrow. So in that sense, uh, the second law of thermodynamics takes a bunch of events that are perfectly cool with the first law of thermodynamics and explains why certain ones occur and other ones don't. And for that reason, uh, you can usually define the direction of time advancing in terms of that. So we do know, for instance, coffee mugs are, are knocked off of tables and shatter and all that good stuff. We also know that they do not jump back together and, and leap onto a tabletop. Uh, and that's one of the hallmarks of time is that in the direction that time flows, uh, coffee mugs fall and shatter and they don't put themselves back together and jump back up. That's the opposite of, of the order of time. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, you might also think of a more mundane situation. Let's imagine you take, uh, let's say you take water at, 24 degrees Celsius, and then you take an ice cube at, mm, oh no, let's, let's, let's not use ice cube, let's just use water, uh, and you take water at 18 degrees Celsius, and they're, each of them are, say, 50 kilograms, and you mix them together. Now, since they're both 50 kilograms, they're both water, one was 24, the other one is 18, you know, thermodynamically speaking, that it's going to come to equilibrium halfway between 18 and 24 and the distance between 18 and 24 is six so it's going to fall back to 21 degrees celsius okay that's that's the normal occurrence and that's what the first law of thermodynamics tells us uh however the first law of thermodynamics is also completely happy if you put these two uh quantities of water together these two 50 kilograms of water you put them together and all of a sudden, the one with the uh, 18 degrees Celsius temperature drops, in fact, to 15 degrees Celsius. And in doing so, gives up its heat to make the other 50 kilograms of water jump up to 27 degrees Celsius. Now, if you apply new, uh, the first law of thermodynamics to that problem, you'll see that there's no violation of the first law of thermodynamics. But there is definitely a violation in the second law of thermodynamics, as you can see in the Clausius statement that we just mentioned, which is heat can flow spontaneously from a hot object to a cold object. So heat flows from the 24 degrees Celsius water into the 18 degrees Celsius, not the other way around. OK, now another one of the key things that we use to define the second law of thermodynamics and uh, a thing that helps us in everyday life is something called a heat engine. So heaters, certain types of heaters, essentially just about all of them, but certain types of heaters are heat engines. Car engines, diesel engines, uh, they're heat engines. Uh, various things are heat engines. And what they are is sort of some cyclic process uh, where you take a difference in temperature and you take a working substance and the working substance has some uh, work put into it or taken out of it or something along those lines. And because of that difference in temperature, you actually get out some useful work. What well, turns out in that process, this is another version of the second law of thermodynamics that'll be stated later in, in better terms, but I'm just giving you roughly an idea. Uh, there is a version of the second law of thermodynamics it basically says hey energy is conserved mass energy whatever you want to call it is conserved but when you convert energy into a very specific form called heat 
uh, that's sort of a bastardized version of energy. And once you convert some energy to heat, you're never, ever, ever going to get all of it back out. Okay. And you can sort of think about this on the atomic level as you put, you know, those 250 kilograms of water together and the one at 24 degrees Celsius has atoms and molecules, which in the case of water, it's pure water, it's just going to be molecules. But all of those molecules have a very distinct kinetic energy that we know of from, uh, you know, basically the ideal gas laws and stuff like that. And that's directly related to the temperature. And since it's 24 degrees Celsius, that kinetic energy is higher than the kinetic energy of the molecules in the other 50 kilograms at 18 degrees Celsius. But what's going to happen is the molecules interacting with each other from the two systems are going to cause the 18 degree molecules to start speeding up. That is not a change in temperature, though, OK? It's not a change in temperature until the average translational kinetic energy. That means uh, kinetic energy of the molecules in the in-out direction, kinetic energy of the molecules in the left-right direction, and uh, kinetic energy of the molecules in the up-down direction. Those three versions of kinetic energy add up to give you something uh, proportional to the temperature in Kelvin. So once the net effect is that all of the molecules in the what was originally 18 degrees Celsius water, once that net effect is that or once uh, those molecules and atoms have a net average higher kinetic energy, then heat has fully been transferred and we actually have uh, a potential equilibrium situation. But the main thing is that's the way that heat spontaneously goes from one object to another through these collisions. And you can imagine that at the end of all that, each of those atoms has gained a very specific amount on average of kinetic energy. And the, the likelihood of you being able to pull exactly the right amount out of each molecule is essentially nil. So you can also think of the second law of thermodynamics as sort of a statistical or probabilistic interpretation. Uh, it's sort of like trying to herd cats, but let's say instead of just, you know, one, two, or even a dozen cats, imagine having Avogadro's number of, of cats, right? And you give them all some kind of play toy, and then you want to get exactly all the play toys back, you know, no matter what they did with them. So that's another way of thinking about the second law of thermodynamics is that you're you're supplying energy from the hotter object to the colder object and to pull all of that uh, heat energy back out, you, it's just not going to happen. Okay. Anybody have any questions on that rough statement of the second law of thermodynamics? Okay. So, so far we've only learned officially the second law of thermodynamics and the Clausius statement, which says heat can flow spontaneously from a hot object to a cold object. Uh, heat will not flow spontaneously from a cold object to a hot object. So when your mother says, you know, close the door, or you're letting all the AC out, that's technically not correct according to the second law of thermodynamics. You don't let cold out because cold can't go out and give up its heat to the hot. Uh, you're letting, say, heat in. That, that would be acceptable from a second law of thermodynamics standpoint. Of course, it doesn't matter. I mean, we're not talking that accurately and precisely when we're talking about everyday life. But just to give you an idea, yes, it's not appropriate to say, or at least it's inconsistent with the second law of thermodynamics to suggest that the air conditioning is esca escaping, even though we all know exactly what's meant. So this other version of the second law of thermodynamics, or one of these other versions, deals with these heat engines I was telling you about. And uh, as I told you, one version of a heat engine is internal combustion engine that runs on gas with spark plugs. Another one's a diesel engine, which runs on diesel fuel without spark plugs. Uh, a steam engine is another one. And in fact, we've made various uh, theoretical heat engines. And I say we, I mean, brilliant physicists that are not me. <laughs> <laughs> over time and engineers over time have made impressive theoretical constructs of heat engines and those heat engines are sort of a gold standard uh the carnot engines one of them the sterling engines another uh the auto cycle otto cycle like the man named Otto. uh that's another one 
And that once you figure out how those uh, heat engines work and you can calculate the efficiency of it, what you'll discover is that another version of the second law of thermodynamics is that no heat engine can ever be as efficient as one of those theoretical constructs, the Carnot engine, the, the Stirling engine, or the auto cycle. And like I said, there are more too. Uh, so that's that's another way of stating the second law of thermodynamics. And it turns out we've done all the work and it shows that every one of these versions that you'll find in this chapter and various other books are all equivalent. So if we're going to go on into the second law of thermodynamics, then we need to make some sense of heat engines. I will tell you at this point, a heat engine uh, uses certain quantities of heat called QH, QL, and W. QH is the heat in a heat engine that comes from a warm reservoir and enters the uh, heat engine. And then part of that heat is wasted and goes out as Q low into a colder environment. But the rest of it goes strictly into doing work. And that's what an engine does. A heat engine takes a heat and converts some fraction of it to usable work. So an example of a heat engine uh, can be drawn schematically like this. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys. Uh, just as soon as I figure out where everything, there it is. Okay. Now here's where it's going to probably ask me to download something that I've downloaded a thousand times. Well, it hasn't so far, so that's a good sign. I think this is doing it. It appears to be doing it. Okay, there it is. So a, a version of a heat engine, for instance, might be you imagine this, which we talked about before, as a heat reservoir. So this is a heat reservoir whose temperature is TH. And if hopefully you remember that a heat reservoir is something that's so large compared to the system that you're looking at that you can take any amount of heat from it without it changing temperature. Now, from that is going to flow an amount of heat QH. And that QH is flowing into the heat engine. And then the heat engine is actually going to convert some of that into useful work that goes this way. And then the rest of it, which you cannot avoid, is Q low. And that Q low is, in fact, going to go into another heat reservoir whose temperature is T low. Okay. Now, in this scenario, the heat engine really is the central part right there. The part that takes in some heat, QH, uh, delivers some work, W, and then exhausts some energy wasted, QL. Okay? So that is a schematic of a heat engine. And in fact, one version of uh, the second law of thermodynamics is that this particular heat engine that I'm getting ready to draw now is impossible. So if you had, for instance, an amount of heat QH coming out. What, what does the dotted red circle in the first uh, part of the diagram represent? The dotted red circle is sort of the schematic of what, what the actual heat engine is. In other words, the heat engine's got to be in an environment. So normally the heat engine has access to a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir, but it's not necessarily part of the heat engine. So I put it in a circle and just say, whatever's taking that heat QH and making part of it into work and then sending the rest out, that thing is the heat engine. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. So this construct right here is impossible okay that is yet a, like i said another version of the second law of thermodynamics is that this is impossible actually i should probably do this
So there's no process by which you can turn 100% of any heat into work. Every, every process in which you're converting heat into work has to have some waste, okay? So that's a typical schematic of a heat engine. Your book does a really good job. Uh, by the way, this TL and TH are called operating temperatures. The work is the work you get out. Uh, and in this scenario, whenever we use the symbols QH, QL, W, at least when we're dealing with heat engines, they're always understood to be positive. So we get rid of those sign conventions like we did earlier. Uh, that's one of the main aspects that you got to take into account is that we don't have a negative QL or a negative W or anything like that anymore. Okay. Now, if you look at this heat engine on the left, the one that's real, what we see is that Q heat has to be equal to the work plus QL. So that comes in handy because it turns out that the efficiency of a heat engine, efficiency is given the symbol E and it's defined to be, I like this definition, what you get, and I mean what you get that's useful, what you get divided by what you pay for. Now, uh, hopefully you recognize from the diagram on the right that what you get is the work that you get out of the heat engine. So this should be work out. But what you put in is QH. Because that's the total amount of energy put in. And yes, yeah, some of it's got to be wasted. Now, because of what I said with that little equation up there, QH equals W plus QL, uh, because of that, we can also say that W is equal to QH minus QL. So I can say QH minus QL up here over QH. Whoa, not like that. And what we get is the efficiency is equal to W over QH, but it also equals QH minus Q low over QH, which can be separated into one minus QL over Q high. So that's the heat taken from the warm reservoir is QH and the heat uh, delivered to the cold reservoir is QL. And this is the efficiency of a heat engine. Any questions on that? Now, we also talked about earlier uh, terms like adiabatic, uh, isothermal, isobaric, uh, isochoric, isovolumetric, all those cool things. Well, it turns out that you can actually use those phrases still when you're dealing with a heat engine. And in fact, if you want to try to make the best possible, most efficient heat engine, what you generally do is you uh, imagine a heat engine so perfect that it uh, it would actually have the best efficiency possible. So we could imagine a heat engine that runs on an ideal gas because ideal gases are ones that, you know, no matter how cold they get, the gases, the atoms or molecules in the gases don't attract each other. Uh, all the collisions at the microscopic level are elastic and uh, a bunch of cool stuff like that. So that's kind of helpful. Uh, another thing is we can assume there's no friction. Uh, we can assume that it is quasi-static, meaning uh, it moves very, 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 very slowly. And it moves, in fact, from one equilibrium state to another equilibrium state. And those two equilibrium states are only infinitesimally uh, far apart. And in fact, it's so close that you can at any time turn the process around and start running it backwards and you'll automatically in going backwards return back on the same path you came in 
that's called a reversible process. So these theoretical constructs like the Carnot engine, the Stirling engine, and the Otto cycle, those are ones that run on ideal gases, are quasi-static and reversible, have no friction, and uh, basically for those, we're going to figure out what their efficiency is and then use that as sort of the gold standard of efficiency. Now, I used to take a lot of time to make sure I derived all these expressions, but your book does a pretty good job of it. I, I think it's perfectly reasonable for uh, you to be able to derive uh, this version of the Carnot efficiency. And your book goes through that, doing some simple differential equations, but a little more complicated than differential equations we did before. But still, you can just go through that process and reach the derivation, which ultimately says, here's the, the Carnot cycle efficiency. Turns out the Carnot efficiency is E is equal to one minus T low over TH. Uh, that's not transparent. That's not an immediately obvious thing. And in fact, your book goes through the long derivation uh, using the parts of the, of the Carnot cycle that's are adiabatic. And then there's other parts that are uh, isothermal. And working out all those things ultimately is able to reach the conclusion that QL over QH is equal to TL over TH, which is why the efficiency, which was 1 minus QL over QH, becomes 1 minus TL over TH. Okay, that's ultimately what happens. Now, there is a quick and dirty way of looking at it, and that's by introducing a variable called the entropy. So it turns out to be a, a state variable. There is a state variable. S called entropy. and defined as uh, sometimes you'll say uh, delta S is equal to the Q over the T. So if you find out how much heat is either added to the system or taken away from the system and you divide it by the temperature at which that occurs, then you'll get the change in entropy, which is uh, the delta that you see there. Of course, that also becomes ds is equal to d bar q over t, where I'm putting that bar on the d again because q is not a state variable. And remember, state variable means, hey, if you've got like, you know, maybe the, a certain system needs six state vari variables to define it. If you know uh, an equation of state, then five of them is enough because the equation of state can be used to find the sixth one. Well, when you're talking about something like heat, there that is not a state variable, and you can't just you know follow a path and then follow a different path between the same two points and expect the amount of heat added or taken away to be exactly the same. However, with entropy, you can do that. So if you have uh, some state variables at the initial state and some state variables at the final state. And you take one path from the initial state to the final state and integrate that ds. If you try another uh, path from the initial state to the final, you'll still get the same ds. And every path you'll get is the same ds. So that's really helpful. But the main reason I bring this up is one, we're going to use that to get yet another definition of uh, the second law of thermodynamics. But right now, I think you can see that uh, this quantity S uh, entropy, the entropy always 
and I'm talking the total entropy change. Always increases R remains constant. And if it remains constant, you know it's because, uh, that was a really bad looking word remains there. If it remains constant, that's because it was a, a reversible process. In other words, only during a reversible process does the entropy remain unchanged. Is the D and the DQ over T equals DS supposed to, is the cross on the D supposed to mean something? Yeah, that's that. Uh, I've used it a couple times before, but yeah, it's trying to tell you, hey, this looks like the D that you could put after an integral. And when you integrate DQ, you get Q. But I put that bar on it because you can't do that. <laughs> okay. It's not, it's not a one form, which is what I've been hinting to you about these DSs and DQs and DXs and DYs. It's not one of those. It really is just, we want to consider an infinitesimal change. So we use the DQ instead of the delta Q notation. But in this case, it has to be only an infinitesimal change. It can't be an integral, uh, integrand, for instance. We did that before, for instance, when I did the first law of thermodynamics, I said DE internal is equal to D bar Q minus D bar W because W and Q are also not state variables. Q is the same Q here, so clearly that's not, but the W is also not a state variable. So uh, if you have delta S equals zero, that implies it's reversible. And as I told you, these, that's really bad looking in there. As I told you, these uh, theoretical engine uh, heat engine constructs, they are actually designed to be the most efficient they can. So to do so, they make them uh, reversible, ideal gas, quasi-static, all that good stuff. So when delta S is equal to zero, that implies the process is reversible. And as I said, the Carnot engine is a reversible process. Since that delta S is equal to zero, that means QH over TH is equal to Q low over T low which I think you can see results in T low over TH is equal to Q low over QH. So if we just introduce the idea of entropy, then we can easily make the jump to the new version of efficiency when we're talking about the efficiency, for instance, of a Carnot engine. Let me get rid of this part. Uh, uh, uh. Get rid of this, get rid of this. That's good. Get back to my blue, like that. Okay, so this is the Carnot efficiency. So I really should label it as such. I'm going to say Carnot. So let me give you an example so this makes sense to you. Now, it's important, the stuff I went through, I sort of went through the bare minimum of what you should go through uh, so that you can solve physics problems about efficiency. So you've seen the schematic diagram where heat comes out of the warm reservoir into the heat engine. Some of that heat is turned to work, which is useful. The rest of it is wasted and released into the environment. And because of that, and just the idea of conservation of energy, we see that QH has to be equal to the work done plus the QL. And we also know that the definition of efficiency is work over heat added, which ultimately leads us to one minus QL over QH. All of that stuff, knowing all that, sort of the bare minimum of what you need to be able to solve uh, heat engine problems. 
Now, in the case of the Carnot cycle, which I'll talk about a little bit more, the efficiency becomes something a little more nice in that you don't have to use one minus QL over QH. You can use uh, one minus TL over TH. And that's what I put in the red box there is one minus TL over TH. Let's turn this back to black so I can do that. And I'm going to go back and say this is equal to E. And I'll say Carnot again. And then I'll do my red like this. So that is the efficiency of a Carnot engine, which was invented by a guy by the name of Sadie Carnot around the World War I era. Okay. Now, let me show you how to work a problem with regards to this by just doing a simple example. And uh, by the way, your book does talk about a steam engine in section 20-2-1. Uh, he talks about a turbine, which is extremely in important. For instance, when we have coal-powered power plants or uh, nuclear-powered power plants or even solar power-powered plants, a lot of these different types of power plants just use a turbine with steam. So it's just a matter of what are you doing to, to make steam out of water? Well, you're heating it up. Well, what are you using to heat it up? You're either burning coal or you're allowing nuclear reactions to occur that heat up the water. That's a nuclear power plant or so on and so forth. But all of them essentially, well, just about all of them have steam turning a turbine and then that turbine turns the uh, the turbine turning turns it into uh, basically energy, and that energy can be sent out as electricity over the electrical grid. But your book also talks about, for instance, the four-cycle engine. Uh, it doesn't talk too much about the two-cycle engine, but they basically uh, have in that section 20-2-1 uh, the four-cycle engine where basically there's a, a, a first cycle where basically the intake valve of the cylinder is open and the piston pulls is pulled down in the cylinder. And in doing so, it sucks the fuel, which is normally either gasoline or diesel fuel or whatever, it sucks it into the chamber. And then on the next pass, the piston compresses that gas and if it happens to be a diesel engine, it compresses it sometimes by a factor of as high as 15. So in other words, maybe the thing is initially, like if you're talking about a really big ship as opposed to just a car, uh, it's not unreasonable to have a piston that has uh, 15 quarts as the size of the piston, in other words, the volume of the piston. So if you have that type of uh, engine where one of the pistons is 15 quarts, if it's a diesel, it's not unreasonable for that diesel to compress that 15 quarts down to one quart. And that big of a compression causes the diesel fuel to explode on its own without a spark plug whatsoever. Whereas if you do gas, it's normally on the order of a factor of two or three compression ratio. And that doesn't get the fuel hot enough to explode by itself. So at the instant that the piston compresses the gas to its maximum density, uh, a spark is generated that jumps from the little nub on your spark plug out to, say, the little hook at the other end of the spark plug. So when you look at a spark plug, it's got a little tab like that, and it's got a little finger up under it like this. And that little gap in this highly oxygen and gas-filled uh, environment with electricity lighting up on it, it basically makes a lightning strike that jumps from one part to the other. That lightning strike is essentially fire that causes an explosion. That explosion uh, is the power stroke. It actually pushes the piston head down and that piston head going down causes the actual shaft, the, the crankshaft to actually turn. That's where the power comes in. Those other two, there was no power derived, but if you have multiple cylinders, those other ones will be out of phase such that they can keep it going while that one's doing the stuff that doesn't generate power. Uh, then it's going to do one more cycle where it's going to come back around and compress again, but this time it's not so much compressing as it is expelling the used gas because now the exhaust valve in the cylinder is open and you're pushing the, the excess burnt fuel out through the tailpipe 
uh, and it, uh, uh, at the end, it goes through the tailpipe, but initially it's just going through the exit valve and the piston. So your book does do a good job. The author does a good job explaining those different types of engines. Uh, what I want to show you is the Carnot engine, and what I want uh, uh, what I want you to do is uh, be able to solve problems. I also say that in section 20-2-2, your author uh, takes time to explain uh, why you really need a difference in temperature between the heat reservoirs or you can't get any work done. And that also relates to the heat death of the universe. Eventually, the, the temperatures of the entire universe will be so similar that heat can't flow from one to the other and nothing really can happen anymore. And and that's sort of the biggest long-term death of the universe in its entirety, not, not the solar system, not the galaxy. I'm talking the universe, okay? So let's skip out of that. What I'm going to tell you regarding the, uh, regarding the Carnot engine, I'm going to do a P versus V diagram. But first, I want to uh, do a little example with efficiency. So let's look at an example. I'm going to call this example one. Anybody have any questions? I've been saying a lot of words now, but I ain't been doing a lot. So uh, this is example one. Does anybody have any questions on anything I've said so far? I have a question, but it's not theoretical. It's more um, related to new sciences. Okay. So with like all the recent news about fusion energy, are they mm -hmm. still mostly just boiling water or is it is it a new type of... Um, so yeah, what, what our power plants do is not fusion, but fission. They're using like uranium or something like that. And the difference is in fusion, you have two small molecules or two small atoms, generally atoms, I don't know why I even said molecules, but two small atoms that you force together to make one bigger atom. But the weird thing is when you make that bigger atom, uh, the mass of the new bigger atom is not the same as the sum of the masses that went into it. And that difference in mass multiplied by C squared is the amount of energy that you get out for that particular fusion. That is, uh, that is the way inside the sun works. Uh, if you talk about fission, then fission is you take one big atom like uranium-235 or uranium-238 or whichever, 239, uh, and you break that down into two or more smaller atoms, the sum of those atoms are not the same as the total big atom was before. And again, you get that difference in mass multiplied by C squared equals E. Now, what's recently been uh, worked out with regards to fusion is that we're getting closer to actually being able to have controlled fusion at a lower temperature. It's Right now, what we know is the easiest fusion possible is the fusion of hydrogen into helium, and that takes a temperature of 10 million Kelvin. So when a star is being born, for instance, in outer space, uh, it's not going to become a star and be efficiently fusing hydrogen into helium until some part of it reaches a critical temperature of about 10 million Kelvin. And once that's the case, then the average kinetic energy of the nuclei in that, which is basically just hydrogen, those nuclei can go fast enough to overcome the Coulomb barrier and ram into each other. And what will happen is two uh, hydrogen nuclei, which is a proton by itself, will run into another one, which is a proton by itself. And oddly, one of those protons will spontaneously become a neutron. So you've now got a proton and a neutron, which is actually called deuterium. That's the isotope two of hydrogen. And then that can group up with another one and another process can go on. But in the end of it, we basically get some energy out and that's fusion. But like I said, that requires 10 million Kelvin. And what we found recently is, or what some scientists have found is a somewhat colder version of fusion. So we might actually ultimately be able to do fusion uh, power plants, which would be safer and uh, can actually generate more energy because right now uh, fission is what we use and fission requires really big molecules, which are horrible. Uh, Uranium is not very good to work with. Plutonium is not very good to work with. Uh, all those things are really not very good to work with. 
So does that make sense? But they're still converting the energy probably through a turbine with some kind of liquid turning into gas. Exactly. They use the heat that's generated from the nuclear process to boil water, and then the water turning to steam rushes over a turbine. And the reason we do that is companies like GE and Philips and, and these really nice, long-living companies have put a great deal of research into the analysis and the discovery of how to make a really efficient turbine. So those, uh, those turbines are among the most efficient things we have. And even then, they, they are skirting in the 40s or uh, maybe close to 50% efficiency. So that's it's not, not as efficient as you might think, but it's still, that that's, that's sort of a gold standard of, of efficiency is the steam turbine. All right, so let's do this example one. I think I answered that question. And if you have any more questions, by all means, ask, ask me. But let's imagine an uh, engine... Uh, let's say an engine has an efficiency of 18% and produces about 25,000 joules of work every second. So you can think of this as joules of work, or you can think of it as 25,000 uh, watts, because obviously a joule per second is a watt. What I want to know is A, how much heat input is required? or I'll write is how big is QH. Notice I'm actually, by writing that way, instead of saying how much heat input is required, I'm actually giving you a little bit of the answer. That's part of the, the nature of, saw, of working uh, heat engine problems is figuring out what terminology means what. So when they're talking about heat being added for a heat engine, that should be bing, 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 a bell going off in your head saying that's QH. And then part B is uh, how much heat is wasted. And I say wasted, but I want you to understand it's not like something that we could just make better. A lot of times you're really at the maximum efficiency that you can get for that particular engine. So how much heat, and I'll call that QL, is wasted. So there I go again. Uh, making the big leap, which is identifying wasted heat as Q sub L. Okay. So the efficiency E, this is a solution. And actually, I should probably do a different color. So I'll do solution. Here's part A. So I know the efficiency is, in fact, work divided by. Q sub H. And we know, for instance, the efficiency is 0 0.18. Notice I changed that to a percent, I mean to a decimal instead of a percent. That's equal to 25 kilojoules. Again, we could work this as watts and that would be acceptable. As uh, long as you're doing the same to both sides, it'll be okay. But generally uh, we talk in terms of energy, which is joules, but sometimes you can talk in terms of power, which is joules per second. Uh, what we're trying to solve for, of course, is QH. So we get that QH is actually equal to 25 kilojoules divided by 0 0.18 is the efficiency. And when I do that, I say 25 divided by 0 0.18. And I get 138.9. kilojoules. And obviously, I only had two sig figs, so technically this and this should be uh, underlined as non-significant figures. So this is the answer for part A. So notice that's 
uh, essentially 140. I mean, if I did it to the proper number of sig figs, it'd be 140 kilojoules put in, and you're only getting 25 kilojoules out. 18% efficiency to 20-ish, 22%. That's the typical efficiency for an actual uh, gas engine. So, and yes, their uh, diesel engines are a little bit more efficient, but still not great. Still on the on the orders of 20%. Anybody have a question on that before I start into B? All right, so part B, uh, they want to know how much is QL. Well, we know the efficiency E is equal to uh, 1 minus QL over QH. Again, that's just the pure efficiency. That's not for a Carnot engine. Uh, we know that that is actually equal to 0 0.18. Now, ideally, we would like to find QL without using anything we calculated. That's sort of the golden rule when solving physics problems or chemistry problems or science problems in general. Unless you absolutely have to use a number you calculated, it's best not to. Okay, Just in case you made a mistake on the number you calculated, then you're going to have two mistakes, even though you might have done the second part right. So I will ideally try to do that, but you can't always. So uh, 0.18 equals 1 minus QL over QH. Okay. Well, guess what? It looks like we're not going to get that unless we do Q, uh, use QH. But I could go back and say, well, this is also equal to QH minus QL over QH, because that's the definition of efficiency. Remember, Q hot was equal to uh, W plus QL, so that's where where that's coming in. Uh, we already have QH, but we're wanting QL. Uh, this isn't coming very easily unless I use it, so I'm going to just have to suck it up and 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 use the existing formula. So I'm going to say zero. Oops, evidently I'm going to erase a bunch of stuff first. I'm going to say 0 0.18 is equal to 1 minus QL over 138.9 kilojoules. Okay. And I'm keeping the extra sig figs as we're supposed to do. Remember, you always keep at least one or two extra sig figs for intermediate calculations. Now I can say that 1 minus 0 0.18 is equal to QL over 138.9 kilojoules. And of course, that's equal to, notice if we take 18% from 1, we get 0 0.82 is equal to QL over 138.9 kilojoules. So finally, I can say QL is equal to 0 0.82 times 138.9 kilojoules. So I'm going to take that figure, multiply it times 0 0.82, and I get 113.9 kilojoules. Again, only two sig figs, so I really need to underline that. And that is my answer for part B. So you can see uh, the trend continues with physics, where a lot of it is you're first introduced to some new terms and new equations. And then the job is by trial and error and experience and seeing other examples, you slowly make sense of what each of the symbols mean. And then you just start looking for equations that relate the symbols you want to know to the symbols you do know. And that's how you solve physics problems. Okay. Any question on that example? All right. So let me show you what a Carnot cycle is. So I'm going to stop this for a second and show you what the Carnot engine or Carnot cycle is. And I think you'll start to see how it bears some resemblance, if you will, to a regular engine. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a vertical axis that measures P, of course. 
And then we're going to have a horizontal axis that measures volume, so pressure versus volume. And we've already seen, at least for ideal gases, how things uh, behave. But in the case of a Carnot cycle, we are going on the assumption that the, the gas is, in fact, a uh, uh, ideal gas and that it's a slow reversible process. So we're getting the best we possibly can. And what it involves is first an uh, isothermal process at temperature TH from, I'll say from point A down to point B. That part is isothermal, and in fact, during that part, there will be a heat, positive QH, that enters the actual fuel. Then we're going to have another lower isotherm at temperature TL, and the gas is now going to expand. Notice I'm going from left to right. So that means the gas is actually expanding in the two cases. So A to B is an, ex an isothermal expansion. And then B to C is going to be an adiabatic expansion. Now, adiabat uh, adiabatic expansion means that no heat flows in or out. We've talked about how heat flows. It's literally molecules or atoms bumping against each other in such a way that ultimately all the molecules and atoms have a larger or smaller net kinetic energy, uh, smaller for the hotter object and larger for the colder object. And that takes time. So a lot of times something's adiabatic in the case of, for instance, a gas engine or a diesel engine, specifically because the explosion happens so fast. So when, when gas explodes inside of a piston in an engine, uh, the heat can't really flow anywhere, so it is an adiabatic process. So that's what this B to C is, is an adiabatic process. Now, from C to D, you have another isothermal process. So what we did is we had a gas at temperature T high, that expanded isothermally, in other words, without TH changing, while QH was put in. So when you actually add heat to a piston, just like if you heat up a balloon, it's going gonna, it's gonna to expand. Same thing happens with a piston. If you uh, heat it up or apply heat to it, it's going to cause the gas inside the piston to expand. Then all of a sudden, uh, you can allow the temperature to change and the thing's going to expand again just because it had a little bit more energy than it expanded for, only now it's happening adiabatically. And then it's going to do another isothermal uh, process, but in this case, it's gonna be isothermal and heat is gonna leave, and that heat is a positive QL, and it's gonna do so from C to D isothermally. Now, the final step is uh, an adiabatic compression from D to A. And again, that's adiabatic, so no heat flows in or out. So I'll write this right here. Adiabat. And I'll write this right here. Adiabat. Remember, adiabatic is the... Uh, is the adjective, and adiabat could be the noun or the subject that we're talking about. So the process uh, on the graph is called an adiabat because the process was done adiabatically. Okay. And you see, of course, since they're on THs and TLs, the other two, A to B and C to D, are isothermal processes. So that's really all you really need to, to know to go through the derivation uh, and in fact, the derivation requires you to use the fact that isothermal uh, means that the temperature change can't change. So uh, when you go to calculate work, work is equal to nRT times the ln of dV, or excuse me, times the integral of dV over V. In other words, we just solved the ideal gas law for P because the work is the integral of PdV. 
but it's isothermal. So R, or excuse me, so T is a constant. So the NRT part of, of the ideal gas law comes out in front of the integral and the one over V part is what you integrate and that gives you a natural law. Then in realizing that the process was adiabatic from A to B, that tells you that the internal energy couldn't change because we know that the internal energy of an ideal gas is like, you know, three halves or five halves or nine halves uh, NRT. So uh, basically, if the T doesn't change, there's no change in internal energy. That means the heat added must be equal to the work done. So all of a sudden, you've now got that NRT natural log of V2 over V1 is equal to uh, the work as well. So that's that's a little rough outline of how you get started. Your book, like I said, goes through the whole process so you can uh, understand it. But the main thing is when it's all said and done using, you know, TH, VH to the gamma minus one power equals T low times V low to the gamma minus one power and all that good stuff. We ultimately can get that version of the ideal or of the efficiency for a Carnot engine being one minus TL over T high. So let's look at an example now that I've sort of explained the Carnot engine. Okay, anybody have any questions on the Carnot engine? Any of the parts or anything? Your book does take the time to mention that real heat engines usually come somewhere between uh, 60 and 80 percent of the efficiency of a Carnot engine. So the, the Carnot engine is not going to be, you know, 100 percent. It's not going to be 75 percent in general cases. In fact, it's likely to be 30, 40, 50 percent. But then the actual engine might be 60 to 80 percent of that. So you can see the efficiencies of engines are quite small. Uh, one of the discoveries by Carnot, this is again Sadie Carnot, uh, who came up with the Carnot engine and lived in the uh, 1700s. He was born in 1796 and died in 1832. But anyways, uh, he came up with Carnot's theorem and Carnot's theorem says that all reversible engines operating between the same two constant temperatures, TH and TL, have the same efficiency. Any irreversible engine operating between the same two fixed temperatures, <clears throat> will have an efficiency less than this. So that ultimately turns out to be very close to another version of second law of thermodynamics, but I think you see the usefulness of it. It's just saying that, hey, yeah, Mr. Younger's talked about the Carnot engine, but he also said there was a Stirling engine and an auto cycle or an auto engine. Uh, well, those are also reversible processes. So what Carnot is telling us is all reversible engines that operate between the same two constant temperatures, TH and TL, have the same efficiency. All right, so let's do an example. I'm going to call this example two. Feel free to ask me any questions as I get ready to do this, though. Anybody have any questions? Okay, so a heat engine. operates between, let's say, uh, let's say 523 degrees Celsius and mm, let's say 273 degrees Celsius. What is the maximum efficiency of that heat engine? So this is a, a direct application, for instance, of Carnot's theorem that we just went over. So all we have to do is we're going to say solution 
And then we're remembering that Carnot's theorem says that all reversible engines acting between two temperatures are going to have the same efficiency and any irreversible engine is going to have a lower efficiency. So the, obviously the maximum efficiency is the efficiency of the irreversible engine. So I'm going to say E reversible is equal to one minus TL over T high. And in fact, what I'm using here is Carnot's engine. But again, they all give you the same value for a given temperature. So in this case, I end up getting one minus, now TL is obviously the 273. So I'm gonna take 273 and I've got to convert that to Kelvin. None of these things work without Kelvin. So 273 plus 273 is obviously 546 uh, Kelvin divided by T high, which is 523 plus 273 is 796. So if I do one minus parentheses, 546 divided by 796, close parentheses, I get 0 0.314. And two extra sig, no, one extra sig fig will be one. So the maximum efficiency is about 31.4%. Notice I just moved the decimal two places to the right uh, to get the actual efficiency. Any questions on that? Now, if you could actually uh, either increase the T high or decrease the T low, you can actually make it more uh, efficient, but that's, you know, just analyzing the math that should uh, convince you that what I just said was right. Let's look at an example three now. Anybody have any questions on example two? All right, so Elon Musk tells you that his engine has a heat input of, let's say, 10.0 kilojoules at, uh, let's say, 450.0 Kelvin, he also claims that the engine outputs or you might say exhausts, outputs uh, 4.50 kilojoules at a temperature of, uh, let's say, 300 Kelvin. I'll say 300.0 just for a sig figs reason. So that's 300. Actually, let me make that a little cleaner. And the question is, do you believe him? Okay. So let's look for our solution. So what we know, does anybody have any ideas of what we're going to do here? Before I jump into telling you the solution.
looks like no. Okay. So one thing we know is the efficiency of any engine is, of course, one minus the heat exhausted over the heat input. Uh, but we also know that the maximum efficiency it could have could be the efficiency of the Carnot engine, the Sterling engine, or the Auto engine. Uh, we're just going to use the Carlo one, uh, or excuse me, the Carnot one, and that's one minus TL over TH. So, first off, let's calculate E max, the maximum possible efficiency this engine could have would be one minus. Now, in this case, the T low is three hundred Kelvin. And the T high is 450.0 Kelvin. So I'm going to do one minus parentheses 300 divided by 450. Close parentheses. And that gives me 0 0.3333. 3. And in fact, since I use four sig figs, that's really uh, should be significant to four sig figs. And that's what the efficiency is, which means the maximum efficiency that the engine could possibly have is about 33.33%. Now, what is the efficiency that Elon's actually claiming? Well, the efficiency he's claiming is E claim is equal to one minus QL over Q hot, which equals one minus. Now QL was the heat output and that's uh, 400, or excuse me, 4.50 kilojoules. And the heat input QH is 10.0 kilojoules. So I'm going to do 1 minus 4.5 divided by 10. And I get 0 0.5500 uh, is the efficiency. So the claimed efficiency. is equal to 55.0%, but the max is only 33.33%. So anybody want to take a guess about what we should do on that one? Should we, should we send our money to Mr. Musk? Should we send our $6 in to get our little blue check mark? No. Exactly. So, no. He's a liar. <laughs> I'm just being funny here. I have no idea if he's really a liar. I've been a little upset about his gullibility on some things of late. But uh, anyways, <laughs> I don't care. He's a, he's a member of the Royal Society, which I'm not. And that makes me jealous but other than that well that needs the richest man in the world that that kind of could be a nice feature to my life i could probably pay all my bills that way that would be woo -hoo. so anybody have any other questions i see nora's here nora do you have any questions you know probably what's going on but yeah, exactly. <laughs> i'll figure it out <laughs> yeah we're doing chapter oh, 20 wait. is that efficiency <laughs> yes okay yeah, this is efficiency. And we've now gotten to a point where we know mm -hmm. a, another version of the second law of, of thermodynamics. The first mm -hmm. one was the Clausius statement. The Clausius statement, remember, said that heat uh, will spontaneously flow from a hot object to a cold object and that heat will not spontaneously flow from a cold object to a hot object. Without work. Clausius, right? Yeah. Now, this new one is another version. It's called the kelvin Planck st statement. And it mm -hmm. says, no device is possible whose sole effect is to transform a given amount of heat completely into work. So that's that heat engine there on the right that I said it's impossible. Yeah. 
that's what we mean. So there's another version of the second law of thermodynamics and your book gotcha. even has a similar little diagram made uh, for that. By the way, your book has these wonderful uh, questions at the beginning of each each champ chapter that you're supposed to answer, take a guess at before you read the chapter. Make sure you're doing that. That really does help you uh, pedagogically in terms of uh, educating and becoming educated. It's really uh, the process of making a guess that was informed, thoughtful, and that sort of thing, and then getting feedback on whether it was right or wrong is really a good way to learn. So do that. And then at the end of each problem, it's got a follow or just about every example in the book, it's got a follow up exercise or something like that, uh, yeah. where you do a slightly different problem. And again, like I told you, uh, John Archibald Wheeler said, never solve a physics problem whose answer you don't already know. You can do the same thing with those exercises, predict roughly what's going to happen and then correct yourself if it doesn't work out. Uh, so. I'm going to say now that in reference to, I'm trying to figure out what this footnote was from. There was a footnote at the bottom of your book. Here it is. It says, uh, we can see from the equation 20-3 that 100% efficient, efficient engine is not possible only, uh, only if the exhaust TL were at absolute zero would 100% efficiency be possible. So if you look at that E, uh, equals one minus TL over TH. The only way you can get 100% efficient is either the TH has to be infinitely high, which doesn't happen, or the TL has to be zero. And uh, being zero would give you 100% efficient. So uh, efficiency. So your book has this little caveat where it says, hey. Uh, but getting the absolute zero is a practical as well as theoretical impossibility. And it says down at the bottom, a real irreversible process cannot be plotted on a PV diagram except approximately if it approaches an ideal reversible process. But a reversible process, since it's quasi-static series of equilibrium states, always can be plotted on a PV diagram. A reversible process, when done in reverse, retraces the same path on the PV diagram. So that's one of them. Oh, I just realized they used the dagger for both of their footnotes. And uh, I, I don't know why they did that, because now I've got three footnotes, each of which are marked with a dagger instead of a dagger, a da double dagger, and a triple dagger. Uh, if an engine had a higher efficiency than that one minus TL over T th uh, TH, it could be used in conjunction, in conjunction with a Carnot engine that is made to work in reverse as a refrigerator. If W was the same for both, the net result would be a flow of heat at a low temperature to a high temperature without work being done. That would violate the Clausius statement. And therefore, this is all known as the third law of thermodynamics as stated in section 2010. So basically, the third law of thermodynamics is something equivalent to saying we cannot reach zero Kelvin. OK, so there's a another version. When you get to section 2010, it'll actually give you the exact wording. But uh, remember, and, and this is something I told them, Nora, is uh, they should have com uh, committed to memory Newton's first law of motion, Newton's second law of motion, Newton's third law of motion, the same thing with Kepler's three laws. So I'm saying not only know verbatim the laws, but know their names, like which one's the first, which one's the second, which was the third. And then I was telling them, you also need to know the zeroth law of thermodynamics, the first law of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics in all of its forms, and then finally the third law of thermodynamics. Okay. Now, I am in some sense skipping 20-3, which is on the auto cycle, but I would tell you that that derivation in example 20-4 is uh, very much a reasonable problem for me to ask you to be able to do, whether that be on a test, a midterm, a final exam. So I'm just going to write out here, make sure... you can, one, understand example 
and to complete last solve example 20-4 on your own. What it is, is basically they're asking you to show that the auto cycle or the auto cycle E is equal to one minus VA over VB to the one minus gamma power, which gamma is that CP over CV we talked about earlier. And I'll remind you that uh, the auto cycle if you haven't read the book yet, you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. But if you've read the chapter, you probably know a little bit. And basically, the auto cycle uh, is quite a bit different from the Carnot cycle in that we'd start here at A. And in this case, we follow a, oops, we follow an adiabatic process from A to B. And then we follow an isovolumic process from V to C. And then we follow another adiabatic process from C to D, followed by a isovolumic process uh, from D to A. So that's the auto cycle. Okay. okay. Yes. Um I don't, maybe I'm confusing things because I learned thermo last semester, but right. is that another way to describe the Carnot cycle? Because it looks exactly like a Carnot cycle. Uh, it's a little different in that the Carnot cycle is uh, isotherm followed by an adiabat, followed by okay. an isothermal contraction, followed by mm -hmm. an uh, adiabatic contraction. This mm -hmm. one is adiabatic and then isovolumetric and then okay. adiabatic, and then isovolumetric. So it's just sort of one by one with the auto cycle, the Stirling cycle, and the Car uh, Carnot cycle. You're considering mm -hmm. other things in addition to adiabatic. So, I see the difference now because there's straight lines going up instead of it being like a little curve. curve. It's, yeah, it's, it's a little confusing, but I get it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's why I didn't want to do too much with this. I just like mm -hmm. you guys to be able to follow through that derivation uh, so that in principle, I could ask you to do that and you could do it on a midterm or a test or a final or something like that. It's it's a it's a good skill to learn and it's a lot easier than the derivation of the Carnot cycle. Now, uh, there's a whole different group of sort of heat engines that we deal with as well. And these, for instance, can be called uh, a refrigerator or an air conditioner. But they also can be, for instance, a modern day heating device is called a heat pump. So those things actually have efficiencies as well. But efficiency is always what you get that's relevant divided by what you pay for. So the efficiency definition is still right. But in this case, I'm going to have to show you that we have a different name for it and show you what the formula is. So for instance, let's start off with, I'll go ahead and write across the top. I'm going to say this is refrigerators, AC, and heat pumps. So refrigerator, AC units, and I'm meaning like the actual air conditioning unit, not the, the unit of air conditioning, AC units and heat pumps. They have something called the coefficient of performance. So let's start off with the first two. I'm going to reiterate that by just underlining them in red. And I'm going to draw a heat reservoir like this that has a temperature TH. And then there is going to be another heat reservoir down here at the bottom that has a temperature TL. 
Now, what we're doing is we're thinking about a refrigerator. The way a refrigerator works is inside the refrigerator, you have food and drinks that you want to stay cold. So you're trying to take heat away from that and expel it into the hotter space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw this and I'm going to imagine an amount of heat QL coming out of the actual refrigerator box. So the, the part where the food is, heat is being taken from that, even though it's colder. And then in exchange for that, because that's a weird thing, right? This is saying heat is flowing from something cold and it's going to flow into something hot. But in order to do that, we have to put in some work. So I'm going to say work is right here. And that arrow is like that. So we can now say, for instance, that work plus QL has got to equal QH. Uh, that's just conservation of energy. Again, I'll put a series of red dots around the part that's the actual heat engine. So the heat engine stuff is going on in there. And that other stuff, those reservoirs could very well, they could be part of the heat engine, but they're usually not. So I'm doing them separate, separately. And instead of talking about uh, the efficiency, we're going to use something called the coefficient of performance. So here it is, coefficient of performance. equals C O P. Okay. And I'm going to say that C O P is equal to what you get. In other words, the thing that you really wanted that you're getting is Q L divided by what you pay for. Well, that's the work you put in. And uh, obviously to violate the second law of thermodynamics in some sense, i.e. by taking heat from a cold place and putting it into a hot place, you're going to have to, you know, get billed by the power company. And that bill will be for the work you put in. So that's the actual coefficient of performance for both a refrigerator and an AC. Okay, so uh, let's use this time. It's now 6.59. You guys come back at 7.09 and we'll finish up. Uh, like I said, I do want to give you all your 10-minute break. So go ahead and take that now. And I'm going to be here the whole time in case you have any questions. Quick question. Is that like dotted line the system? So like the refrigerator itself? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to uh, okay. demarcate or put the boundaries of what the heat engine is. So you'll notice I did that here and I also did it earlier with the Carnot cycle. You can see that's the actual Carnot cycle you were talking to, talking about a second ago. Notice I labeled adiabats and isotherms. Yeah, I see it, yeah. I, and then I did the same thing here on the left. That's just a gen generic uh, heat engine where I circled off that area mm -hmm. to say, you know, part of it has heat coming in and heat coming out and work coming out. That's the heat engine part. Whether it'd be like a turbine or something, but then for like a refrigerator, there's like a condenser or something doing the work. Exactly. So for instance, in the heat engine or the refrigerator is essentially a heat pump running backwards or a heat pump is a refrigerator running backwards. Uh, what you what you can do is uh, you've probably noticed this before. If you take like uh, spray deodorant, or spray hairspray or anything like that when you actually use that you'll feel that it comes out very very cold mm -hmm. because it turns out when you go from high pressure which is what it is inside the can to low pressure it reduces the temperature 
it reduces the temperature, right? So guess what? If you run a fluid, say Freon or something that's not, you know, killing our, our uh, ozone layer, if we <laughs> take that fluid and put it in a piston, and then instead of compressing it with the piston, we actually expand it with the piston, mm -hmm. that liquid is going to cool off a lot. Mm -hmm. And because it's inside of metal tubes, those metal tubes are going to get ice cold. Mm -hmm. And you can essentially just, you know, uh, take a fan and blow it over that and you're going to get colder air. That's literally all, all that needs to be done. You can do it a little fancier, you know, with things going through the fluids and stuff like that. But generally, all you have to do is have something blowing across the metal and you'll actually see them freeze up. And you can even see that, for instance, with your heating unit outside. Uh, on a hot day, you'll often, well, if, you're me if your thing's messing up, you'll have it a lot, but you'll sometimes see ice frozen up on top of your heating unit, even though it's middle of the summer and it's 90 degrees. So, it always worries me that like, oh, sorry, Josiah, you can go. I was going to make so. a, a comment. <laughs> go ahead. What did you say, Josiah? I was just going to say, so do refrigerators run with two separate fan system or fan setups where one is pumping air across a condenser out of it and then one is pumping air across an expander inside into it or is it just the condenser out of it with a second fan going across no it definitely returns it back and then it the condenser is what brings it back to the normal temperature and allows the process to repeat itself uh but they often have two separate stages one of which is for the refri uh the refrigerator and then the more severe ones for the uh for the freezer itself so sometimes you'll see that it'll have a two-stage system. Uh, mine, which is uh, not very old, uh, it only has one system, but you can look at it and you see that basically it takes all this air blowing over those metal parts and they just come through in holes in the back of the refrigerator. Uh, but then that hole goes a little further and goes across the metal again and then empties into the freezer for that part. So it sort of gets a double whammy for the freezer compared to the, the uh, refrigerator. Um, my question is a bit more arbitrary, but it's like, uh, like what what type of like refrigerant or coolant do we use for households? Like, what do we, what what you is that? Still called? buy Freon, I, and I don't know what the names of the new chemicals are. Okay, uh, but they're listed usually by R numbers like they'll say are such and such is you know what we're using now uh actually let me pull it up real quick it should be pretty straightforward to find i have friends that work in the hvac business i could probably just ask them some of them would actually <laughs> uh but some of them not so uh refrigerant so refrigerants are r410a r22 I think the R22 is the old Freon type stuff. R4, uh, FJC 533, a chemical compound capable of transitioning from liquid to gas and back again is the definition of a refrigerant. What is refrigerant and AC? Yeah, it does say most residential air conditioning units contain the standard R22 refrigerant or Freon. So that's what it used to be. Uh, mm. And they're they're still phasing that out, so it's still a little bit expensive uh, because they're phasing it out. There's not as much available. The chlorine-free refrigerant is 410A. I was trying to look for a chemical. It just says it has no chlorine, but it doesn't say this is Linux's website, which you know they make heat and air conditioning units, but they don't say what the refrigerant is. Oh, Josiah, that link is helpful. Sorry, you found my one? mom is screaming. <laughs> oh, okay. I see over here. Uh, dichlorofluorodifluoromethane and chlorodifluoromethane and 112 tetrafluoroethane. Ah, yeah, the, the tetrafluoroethane uses fluorine instead of fluorine. So that would obviously mm -hmm. be a good one because it's not a, a, a ozone attacker. <laughs> What we discovered, uh, I teach this in astronomy as well as in the Physics 100 course, what we discovered was that the carbon, or excuse me, the chlorine in the CFCs, they're, they're called car carbofluoro, excuse me, chlorofluorocarbons, uh, CFCs. And the chloro actually breaks loose from the CFC 
and then floats up through the upper atmosphere and then can combine with uh, an ozone molecule, which is literally O3, and it will make the chlorous oxide, or I think it's chlorodioxide or something like that. Uh, but statistical models of the upper atmosphere suggest that one chlorine atom can probably get rid of 100,000 ozone molecules. So that was what ultimately led uh, Ronald Reagan and the international community to get rid of uh, Freon, at least initially Reagan did it for the uh, the government using them, but ultimately it led to everything. And you can still buy it, but it's like I said, they're trying to phase it out. All new units have to be made without, floor, uh, without uh, Freon and stuff like that. Good questions, Nora. And you said someone gave us a link, huh? a link. Yeah, that was Josiah. It cool. explains like step by step why other things aren't used, and it's it's the chloro part. So I was like, oh, chlorine. Yeah, why do yeah, we putting the chlorine, chlorine in the atmosphere? <laughs> yeah, and actually, it was kind of neat because some of the chemists were thinking about this problem even before they knew that it was happening. Uh, meanwhile, in the South Pole and the North Pole, they were running these experiments, and they kept getting this result that they didn't believe because it was a huge change in the ozone con uh, concentrations and it was making big changes per year and they thought it was something wrong with their equipment until finally they ruled out everything and said, well, I'm just going to publish it. And the same time, a guy by the name of Sherwood, uh, Molina, and uh, I can't remember the other guy's name, they had out already written a paper postulating that those CFCs uh, contain chlorine and that chlorine will break loose from the sun's rays up in the upper atmosphere and there'd be decades of it up there and they don't know what could happen with it. And then eventually someone else uh, basically figured out the chemistry of how CFCs can interact with, or actually how the chlorine can interact with ozone, because, you know, chemical reactions don't take place between a gas and a gas because they're too energetic. So you actually have to have it condense out to at least be a liquid state, usually for a chemical reaction to occur. And she was the woman that figured it out. She was the woman that not only that, she also showed that as the CLO, the chlorine dioxide went up, the ozone went down at exactly the same rate. So it was a really big deal. It's kind of it's kind of neat though. I like that. Uh the stories of discovery are interesting. You put it that way. Anybody have any other questions? All right, it's 709. So I reckon we should begin again. So uh I've already defined this coefficient of performance. Uh I thought we should probably work a couple examples of already did that. Okay. I just found another version of the second law of thermodynamics, but it was the one that I already talked about. So if you want to change this coefficient of performance to maybe a slightly more useful version or just other versions so that you'd have them, you'd see that uh, we could also write it as QL over W is equal to QH minus QL. <coughs> So that's another way of writing it as well. And the COP ideal, so this is sort of like the Carnot engine of refrigerators. That turns out to be TL over TH minus TL. So that's sort of the, the gold standard of uh, coefficients of performance is if you can meet that goal, TL over TH minus TL, then you're really doing awesome. And, and you can't, it's physically impossible. <laughs> okay. That's sort of like being running a Carnot engine backwards or something like that. Okay. So let's let may, uh, let's use uh, some of this stuff to figure out a specific example. In fact, the last example we did was example three, so I'll call this example four. So example four, a freezer has a COP equal to uh, 3.00 0, 0, 
and uses, let's say uses 250.0 watts of power, how long will it take to freeze, let's say, uh, let's say 750.0 grams of water at 0, 0.00 degrees Celsius. Okay. So you see what's happening. We're, we're considering a freezer that has a coefficient of performance of 3.00. And we know that it uh, is actually uses 250 watts. I don't know why I drew that like I had a stroke, but evidently that was one of the things I did. So yay for me. <laughs> All right. So... Uh, the freezer has uh, uses 250.0 watts. And from that, we'd like to figure out how long is it going to take to take 750 grams of water at zero degrees Celsius and, and freeze it? Well, what we know is that the heat required that you have to remember the, uh, the ice cubes are in that lattice and you've got to break those bonds uh, if you're going from the ice to the water, but if you're going from the water to the ice, then you have to steal energy from it. So it'll go slow enough to attach, uh, attach to the other molecules. Well, that heat is called the latent heat and it is given by Q latent is equal to M times the latent heat. Now I'll tell you that the latent heat of, of uh, ice uh, specifically for the freezing process is 3.33 times 10 to the fifth. So I can immediately say that the mass is going to be 0 0.7500 kilograms times 3.33 times 10 to the fifth joules per kilogram. So that's the actual latent heat is 3.33 times 10 to the fifth joules per kilogram. If I multiply that, I want to say 0. 0.75 times 3.33 e to the fifth. And that gives me 2.498, which is one extra sig fig that I'm supposed to have. So 2.498 times 10 to the fifth joules. So that's how much uh, energy I need to actually suck out of the zero degree ice in order to make it freeze. Now, we also know that power is equal to work divided by time so that uh, the work or the energy that you actually use is power times time. That's another thing you can do. Or you can say solve for T and you'd see uh, T is the work you need divided by the power you have. Okay. So now that we have that final version, it's just a matter of figuring out exactly uh, what we have for the work because we know the coefficient of performance, COP. Remember that's supposed to be QL over W. And we already know uh, what the we already know what the uh, W is, or excuse me, this W for the coefficient of power is slightly uh, well, it's somewhat different in that we're actually taking uh, the power that the motor for the refrigerant is using. So I can take and say T is equal to Q load divided by the coefficient of performance. 
that's going to be the work done in actually getting uh, the freezing of the of the water. And then that's going to be divided by the work input. And the work input is 200, or excuse me, 250. Point zero joules per second. So when you take the QL and you put that in there, uh, you can ultimately realize that QL divided by the coefficient of performance is really just the 2.49. I'm going to go ahead and say 750. I'm going to use all the figures instead of just the ones I had times 10 to the fifth. That's the actual full number of joules. Now I'm going to divide that by the coefficient of performance, which is 3.00. And then I'm going to divide all that by the 250.0 joules per second. And you'll see, notice the joule cancels out with the joule. The COP has no units. So I ultimately just get seconds. So we'll do that calculation right quick. I'm going to take that 249,750. I'm going to divide it by three. And then I'm going to divide that by 250. And when I do that, I get 333. Now, there was three sig figs in the 2.49 dot, dot, dot. So I really should only be bringing three sig figs. So I'll put a zero here and then say this is seconds. Now, you know that six minutes is 360 seconds. So this is more like, uh, well, 60 goes into 35 uh, and the 300 five times. So that's five minutes, 33 seconds. So T is equal to five minutes. And 33 seconds. Any questions on that? Does that make sense to everyone? Now for a heat pump, things are a little different. So we just handled the refrigerator and the AC. The equations are essentially the same for two of those. Uh, uh, but a heat pump is significantly different in that with a heat pump, you are trying to take air that's outside and very, very cold and extract heat from it and push it into air in a house that's quite warm. And of course, doing so is going to cost you something. And what it's going to cost you is the heat you put in. So we can imagine it like this. I'll say... This right here is T low and it's outside. Okay. Now, what we need is to have another reservoir that's going to be at a temperature TH and that's going to be inside. And what we're going to do is we're going to take heat from the TL, in other words, from the outside, we're going to take heat and we are going to, in fact, put that heat into the inside. And to do so, we're going to have to put in work W in this way. Again, remember QL, QH, and W are all positive when we're dealing with heat pump efficiencies, air conditioning efficiencies, refrigerator efficiencies, and heat engine efficiencies. Uh, so what we now have is a certain amount of, oops, what did I do? I did not mean to do whatever I did. Hold on a second, I'll bring it back. I think it's coming back now. Must have hit the wrong button. Should come back in a second, hopefully. Maybe.
There it is. Okay, cool. All right. So, so what I was saying is there's an amount of heat uh, coming from the outside, and that amount of heat is going to be Q sub L. And inside the house, we're going to get a certain amount of heat that's going to be Q sub H. And from that, we can see that W plus QL is equal to, well, actually, I probably should say uh, QL is equal to I should say QL is equal, QL, yeah, that's kind of a weird one. I, I was looking at this, and I, I could basically say that W plus QL, well, I could if it wasn't on a race, W plus QL is equal to QH. That's another equation we have. And the coefficient of, of performance of this, again, is what you get divided by what you pay for. What you get that's really useful is how much heat goes into the house. And what you pay for is how much work you have to do to make it happen. Does everybody get that? Does that make sense? The coefficient of performance is given by that formula for a heat pump. So we could say, let's do an example. This will be example five. Example five says a heat pump has a COP of 2.80 and is rated to do work at 1400 joules per second which you could also call watts of course what i want to know is how much heat can be uh can add to your room per second so how much heat can be added per second Okay, so this solution should be pretty straightforward. We know that the uh, coefficient of performance is QH over W. And what we're asked for basically is QH. That's why we show you those diagrams so you can figure out, you know, what is the work? What is the QH? What is the QL? So QH is going to be equal to the coefficient of performance times the work. So QH, in this case, happens to be equal to 2.80. That's the coefficient of performance times the work, which is 1,400. Uh, and in this case, I'm going to again call it joules per second, which means that QH is equal to 1400 times 2.8 is 3928 joules per second, which I'll just write per S. So that's a pretty simple, straightforward calculation of the amount of heat that a particular heater can uh, supply, or a particular heat pump can supply. Anybody have any questions on that?
I will mention your book uh, also does something that's very useful. So if any of you are considering going into the construction side of engineering, uh, one of the things uh, that you have to deal with is, especially if you become a mechanical engineer, mechanical engineers uh, deal more with the mechanical aspects that includes thermodynamics as well as, you know, uh, garage doors and, and things that uh, have to move mechanically for instance, but one of the things we use in the industry of building is the SEER rating. So for instance, I just replaced my air conditioning unit, my heat and air conditioning unit. And I had like a, I think I had a seven or eight SEER unit. It was, you know, probably 15, 16 years old. And I was putting in a couple hundred bucks every year, sometimes five, $600 every summer, uh, specifically to replace the Freon because it was an old enough system where it had Freon. So they'd bring over the R22 and they generally charge you anywhere from like 75 bucks to 150 bucks a pound. And they argue that that's how much the tanks cost. And it's really not anywhere near that. But what they do is they, they, they say it like that. So you can sort of not realize that they're combining their work hour expense into the cost of the Freon. In actuality, you can buy the whole jar that they normally bring. You can get that for less than a hundred bucks and they'll say it costs like three or $400 and sell it to you. But anyways, after I got fed up with doing that and finally realized that I'm wasting too much money doing it, I went ahead and decided to buy a new unit and the new unit, I think was a SEER 14, which is quite a big step up. But what the SEER level is, S-E-E-R, the SEER level is basically the heat removed in BTUs divided by the electrical input in watts. So that's what the SEER is when you talk about a SEER unit on an HVAC. Now remember, heat removed in BTU, the BTU is like the joule or like the calorie. Remember, a calorie was defined to be the amount of heat required to raise one gram of water from 14.5 degrees Celsius to 15.5 degrees Celsius. That's what a calorie was defined to be. And then Joule showed us that that calorie was essentially 4.186 joules. And that gave us another idea. Well, the BTU is the amount of heat required to change one gallon of water from 14.5 degrees Celsius to 15.5 degrees Celsius. So if you do a conversion from uh, grams to gallons, then I think you get an idea of how much, how big the BTU is. So literally you're just gonna take the heat removed in BTUs and you're gonna divide it by the electrical input, which is measured in watts times hours, okay? Uh, you can refer to section 20-4-1 if any of those questions pop up. I'm probably going to avoid those except in homeworks and, and they might pop up in the practice test, but I'm not going to give them to you in the in the actual test. So when we have a test on chapter 20, which I'm thinking uh, might be something that I release on Friday and give you till probably Wednesday to get it done. Uh, but it's going to be an online test. So you can uh, normally I let you take it more than once. It changes each time you take it and only your highest score counts. Uh, it does tell you, by the way, in your book that one BTU per watt hour is actually equal to, actually, no, that's not a conversion. Let's ignore that. I'm not going to give you that. I, I was reading this thing as I was flipping through in your book, and I thought they were showing a conversion, but it looks like they're actually solving a specific problem. So anyways, the SEER is defined for you. The last thing I want to talk about is this entropy, entropy change in melting. So your book does example 20-7. I'm going to let you look at that. So uh, I'll remind you, make sure you fully understand and can solve each example in chapter. So I'll just remind you of that. I'm partly saying that to Nora and a couple other people that came in late just because that was something else I told you at the very beginning. So make sure you guys can do that. Uh, one example is like example 20-7. 
It's 7.30. We got about 19 minutes left. So uh, example 20-7 says an ice cube of mass 56 gram is, is taken from a storage compartment of zero degrees at zero degrees Celsius and placed in a paper cup. After a few minutes, exactly half of the ice and cu uh, ice cube has melted, becoming water at zero degrees Celsius. Find the change in entropy of the 56 grams of ice water. So let's do that example real quick. So this is example from your book 20-7, and it says uh, the mass of the ice cube which I'll label IC because obviously IC means ice cube, is equal to 56 grams, okay? And the temperature of the ice cube is equal to 0, 0.0 degrees Celsius. And after a few minutes, half of... The it says uh, placed in a paper cup after a few minutes, exactly half of the mass, half of the 56 grams of ice has melted. I don't like how that turned out. I don't like how that turned out either. Has melted. And is still at 0, 0.0 degrees Celsius. Okay. What they want to know is what is the change in entropy? Delta S is equal to question mark. And they've given us the definition uh, that delta S is equal to Q over T, which I had given you already. Notice by, for starters, can anybody tell me what the typical units of entropy will be given that it's Q over T? Joules per second? Uh, it's a big T, so that's not time, but... Oh, uh, joules per Kelvin? Yeah, exactly. There you go. So yeah, joules per Kelvin is a typical unit of it. Uh, the sign conventions for Q and W are the same as we used uh, when we were doing the first law of thermodynamics. So if heat is added to the system, it's a positive heat. If work is done by the system, it's a positive work, that sort of thing. So in this case, what I know is here's our solution. We want to know delta S, which is equal to question mark. We know delta S is equal to the heat added or taken away divided by the temperature at which that occurs. And this happens to be a change of phase, which is really nice because if you look at that diagram we did before through the changes of phase for water, when you're actually changing phases, the temperature stays constant. So we don't have to do any crazy integrals or averaging process. Uh, what we do know is that the Q is going to be M times the latent heat. In this case, it's going... Uh, from uh, solid to liquid or liquid to solid. So that's the heat of vaporization, or excuse me, the heat of fusion. So uh, in this case, we're gonna say Q is equal to M times L sub F. And the uh, Q is actually half of 50, excuse me, the M is actually half of the 56 grams. The 56 grams is 0 0.056 kilograms. Half of that would be 25, plus three, it'd be 28. So I'm going to say 0 0.028 kilograms times, now remember we had 3.33 times 10 to the fifth joules per kilogram was the heat of fusion for ice. So I'm just using that figure again. I'm going to say 0 0.028 times 3.33 e to the fifth. And that gives me 9,324 joules. Uh, obviously I only have two sig figs, so I should call that 9.3 9 times 10 to the third. 
but they didn't ask us that question. 9.3 times 10 to the third joules, but that's how I'd write it if, uh, if they actually asked for that question. What they did ask for is to find the change in entropy. So the change in entropy delta S is obviously got to be, uh, in this case, we're actually taking the ice and we're melting it. So heat goes in, which means Q is positive. So I'm going to say uh, delta, or excuse me, Q over T, which is equal to 9,324 joules divided by the temperature, which is 273 Kelvin. So if I divide this by 273, I get 34.2 joules per Kelvin. And notice that is a increase in the entropy. So the entropy actually increased. And what that means is whatever happened to give you that positive change in entropy is something that's likely to happen on its own because the entropy increased. Anybody have any questions on that? Now, your book says, hey, if the temperature is not constant, then use ds is equal to dq over t. But this is where I would normally try to tell you, hey, be careful, you, you need to put a bar on that Q because it's not necessarily a state variable. So it says a careful analysis shows that the change in entropy when a system is moved by a reversible process from any state to any other state B uh, does not depend on the process. That is delta S is always gonna be the entropy at B minus the entropy at A and depends only on the states A and B of the system. Thus, entropy, unlike heat, is a state variable, and any system in a given state has a mass, a temperature, a volume, a pressure, and also has a particular value of entropy. Therefore, the change in entropy for a real process, which is always irreversible, can be determined by calculating delta S for an idealized reversible process. So that's the advantage of state variables is you, you might have something that's so complex you have no idea how to analyze it. But since you're calculating a state variable, the entropy in this case, you can just take a very simple case that starts with the same initial condition and ends with the same final condition, calculate that, and you by default, you get the same the right answer automatically. So what you ultimately get is delta S, which is S final minus S initial. is equal to the integral of ds from the initial state to the final state, which is also equal to the integral of dq over t from the initial state to the final state. So these are all expressions that come in handy, but they all have, of course, that same little warning I told you that dq is not necessarily a real differential, so you got to be careful with it. Uh, let me see. The entropy is path independent, so that's critical. Uh, they do take the time to show entropy as a state variable. That's a very good derivation and proof that they're doing, so I highly recommend you read it and try your best to understand it, but I am not going to ask you to regurgitate or redo that, okay? So let's consider one more example since we got 10 minutes. I'm going to give you an example with entropy. So let's say example. Actually, let's write it in. Let's write it in blue. This thing. Uh, this is going to be example twenty dash eight, and it's going to say a sample of fifty point zero zero kilograms of water at 
at 20.00 degrees Celsius is mixed with 50.00 kilograms. Now you see where I got those numbers I was giving you earlier uh, of water at 24.00 degrees Celsius. Estimate the change in entropy. So uh, I, I mentioned this a couple times in the past, but uh, and I haven't re-mentioned it today, so I should. Uh, one of the common phrases that we use in describing entropy is that entropy is a measure of the disorder of a system. Uh, that's a pretty good uh, word to use, but it also makes it a little hard for you to understand. Uh, I'll give you some examples on that in a second, but right now let's work on this. Uh, what I know is that the heat that goes on here, when I connect these two together, I think you can tell that you're ultimately going to have 100 kilograms of water at 22 degrees Celsius. Would you all agree with that? Okay. So what we have is, here's your solution. Delta S, the total entropy is going to be delta S of the hot water plus delta S of the cold water. That's the main thing we're working out here. And what we're going to say is delta S hot is approximately equal to uh, Q over the average temperature. And delta S cold is approximately equal to Q over its average temperature. That's where, where the estimating comes in. So when I go to calculate delta S hot, I'm going to say it's approximately equal to, now we know that the specific heat of water is 4,186 joules per uh, kilogram. So we're going to say, uh, Q is equal to MC delta T is what we're using here. So I'm going to say for the hot water, there's got to be Q taken away from it. So it's going to be negative. And then I'm going to say 50.00 kilograms times 4,186. Uh, in this case, we're going to say that that is kilojoules. per kilogram, or actually I should say that's 4,000, no, that's just plain joules, sorry about that. 4,186 joule, whoa, another. Joules per kilogram. And then of course you're multiplying that by delta T and you know that in fact, it's gonna change by two degrees Celsius because one of them's at 24 and the other one's at 20 and the middle is going to be 22. So I'm going to say Delta T is 2.00 degrees Celsius. Uh, so now I can go ahead and, oh, I've left off a unit in this specific heat. I was thinking vaporization for a second. So there's your joule. This is kilogram Celsius degree, and this should technically be Celsius degrees as well. Okay, so I'm going to say 50 times 4186 times 2 gives me 4.186. Zero times 10 to the fifth joules. And of course, that's negative because the heat actually left the hot water. Delta S for the cold 
is approximately the same thing, but in this case, it's going to be positive because heat's added to it. You get 50.00 kilograms. You get 4,186, whoa, 86 joules per kilogram Celsius degree. Uh, oh, excuse me, that's not delta S. That's everybody change your delta S. I was, I, I started writing it right, but I'm just doing Q right now and I'm not up to S yet. So, erase that and erase that and in fact i'm going to go ahead and erase the approximately because the q is pretty reliable so i'm going to say q hot is equal to this and q cold is equal to that sorry okay and this one's also going to change uh, in temperature by an amount two degrees celsius because the cold one's going to go from 20 to 22 so 2.00 Celsius degrees, this is going to be positive 4.1860 times 10 to the fifth joules, which is great. Yay, we've got that. But here's the kicker. The delta S is delta S hot plus delta S cold, which I'm going to say is approximately equal to uh, Q hot over T average for the hot plus Q cold over T average for the cold, uh, for the cold one. Let me make sure that's so easy to see that I'm averaging. So I'm going to get rid of that and we'll put T hot and then put a bar over it like that. Okay. Remember the bar means the average. So when I do that, I get negative four one eight six four point one eight six zero times ten to the fifth joules and that should be just plain joules not joules over anything so joules divided by now for the hot one the average temperature between 24 and 22 is 23 and 23 plus 273 is 296. So I'm going to say 296 Kelvin. And notice the minus is there. And now I've got to add to it the Q cold, which is positive 4.1860 times 10 to the fifth joules. But the average temperature for it is it's going from 20 to 22. So the average temperature is 21 degrees Celsius. So 21 plus 273 would be 294. So I'm going to say over 294 Kelvin. And this gives me negative uh, 4.186 E to the fifth divided by 296, or excuse me, 293, no, 296. Why did I have three written down here? Ooh, that's not good. This is supposed to be 296. I think I said it right, but I just didn't write it right. I don't know. Okay, so I'm going to say divide that by 296. And that gives me... Actually, let me write it down over here. That gives me equal to negative 1414.8. Two joules per Kelvin plus four point one eight six e to the fifth divided by two ninety four. That gives me one four two three point eight joules per Kelvin. So I'm going to add that to negative 
one zero or excuse me one eight Ooh, that was supposed to be a two there yeah one four one eight one four one four one eight nine and this gives me roughly nine point six two joules per kelvin in other words the direction we thought that it was going, which was ending up at a temperature of 22, gave us a positive change in entropy, and therefore we expect that to happen. Now, if you did the same thing, I'm going to say it right here. Uh, we actually technically class is over, so you're free to go ahead and go. But I'm going to tell you, if you try the same thing, uh, you can see that the energy or the calorimetry works fine with the 50 kilogram, 24 degrees Celsius water becoming 26 degrees and the 20 degree water becoming 18 degrees. But the entropy would be negative for that. So that's an extra credit problem you can work if you'd like. I will write it down on here so everybody will know. But you're all free to go and... Uh, the only thing I didn't mention to you was this last really cool part, which was that the, uh, well, I also didn't mention the other second law of thermodynamics, the general statement, and I didn't mention that S can also be given by Boltzmann's constant times the natural log of W, which is the number of microstates. Uh, your book explains that. That's kind of a neat idea. So just make sure you work your examples for the textbook from the textbook for this chapter and you should be good to go. I'm gonna explain this uh, extra credit problem on this spot on the notes so you'll see them there. So you guys are free to go, thanks for coming. Remember, I'm gonna to try to have your test two, which will be chapter, oh, and I still gotta fix your test one because y'all got reamed on that one, I apologize, I gotta fix it. I don't know how it happened, but you took the wrong test. Not only did it have the wrong questions, it had the wrong number of questions and it had the wrong points per question. Uh, that being said, you're still going to get the higher of the two scores, but I am going to require everybody to take it, and I'm going to do it as a, as a take-home test or an online test, okay? So uh, go ahead, and you're free to go. I'm going to write out the extra credit here, and then I'm going to shut off this and, uh, of course, take any questions if anybody has them. The, does uh, Bohan or Nora or anybody else have any questions? Uh, I'm good, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. I have a question. Thank you. You too, Professor. Yes. What's your question? Where do we like submit the extra credit problem if we do do it? It'll there will be a place to submit it for this week, which I think is week four. Uh, if you don't see me put it there, feel free to text me and let me know, and I'll I'll do it then. But yeah, it'll, I'll put it there. So the extra okay. is go. <laughs> sorry. Uh, calculate or let's say show that calorimetric calculation says, uh, let's say, shows cold H2O going to 18 degrees, 18.0 degrees Celsius and hot H2O going to 26.00 degrees Celsius is okay. but delta S is less than zero, okay? So uh, what you're supposed to do is actually show that calculation of calorimetry and uh, show that it's completely consistent. In other words, the Q lost is exactly equal to the Q gain when the water changes the cold one from 20 to, to 18 and the hot one changes from 24 to 26 you still get that Q hot is equal to Q cold, which means it is in, uh, consistent with the first law of thermodynamics. And then I want you to calculate, just like we did above, the or estimate the change in entropy 
delta s by calculating the delta s for the hot water the delta s for the cold water and you'll see that in fact we should come up with a negative uh, change in entropy which means the entropy decreases which is not consistent with the second law of thermodynamics the second law of thermodynamics general statement is the total entropy of any system plus that of its environment increases as a result of natural processes and that looks like it looks like everybody's gone thank you everybody appreciated you coming hope you had a good day and uh i will see you all again oh no you are still here i'll see you all <laughs> the names disappeared across the top i didn't see anybody mm. <laughs> i'm getting so old okay anybody have any questions before i split yes go for it um can you explain how we got the average temperature in the denominator? Because I was definitely yeah. not thinking that it was those numbers. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's, it's double to, uh, abstracted because for starters, you're going from uh, the hot water is going from 24 to 22. So 24 to 22, if you take dead center between those two, you get 23. That's the average. So 23 degrees Celsius, but then you got to convert it to Kelvin. And that makes it, of course, uh, 296. So we have to factor in the midway point. It's not just like the average temperature of the hot is 24. Uh, it's, it, it is truly the average temperature of the hot water because the water, hot water started at 24 and ended okay. at 22. Okay. And of course, the middle or the average of those two is 23. And then the cold water did the same thing. It started at 20 and ended at 22. So the average is 21. But then you got to convert them to Kelvin. I guess I missed that. But I I mean, you're mixing the liquids together. So that's why we're saying that their their start point and their end point is the average between the, the hot and the cold. Yeah, but I okay. mean, that's not normally what we do when we're calculating uh, mm. entropy. The, the reason why we did is because it asked us to estimate it. So that mm -hmm. gave us the freedom to just not take into account the fact that the T was changing as a function of Q. Otherwise, we'd have to say, okay, well, what's the Q for this temperature range? And then calculate that and then divide it by that uh, temperature. And, and we keep doing it until the temperature range changed in each case was so small that the value didn't change overall. It'd just be a, a pain in the butt. So sometimes it's just easier if you're not talking about huge changes mm -hmm. in temperature, for instance, going from 24 to 23, R to 22 is a really small change in temperature, so that's pretty acceptable. I see. I see where I was confused. All right. Um, and also, you were cutting out, like, half the time while explaining the extra credit. Okay. And I was going to write down um, some of the notes that you said to, like, mention. Gotcha. But I missed, I missed a lot of that. Okay, so what I said on the extra credit, and this will be on the recording, too, so you can catch that, is uh, I want you to show that the calorimetric uh, remember, we did uh, calorimeters. So calorimetric calculations uh, shows that the cold water going from 20 to 18 degrees Celsius and the hot water going from 24 to 26 degrees Celsius uh, still has Q, uh, Q loss equals Q gain. Remember, that's how I did uh, calorimetry was the thing that was losing heat. Well, you calculate that heat and set it equal to the thing that's gaining heat. So you're just basically going to show each side gives you the same number. That means it's consistent with the first law of thermodynamics. But then I'm going to ask you to do the exact same calculation we did, estimating the uh, average temperature for delta SH and for delta SQ, uh, C. Only this time, the average, since you're going from 20 to 18, would be 19. And since you're going from 24 to 26, it'd be 25. I see. Okay. Gotcha. And what you're going to find is the delta S is be negative for that one. All right. Gotcha. Hopefully that helps. Now it's just us two. So do you have any other questions? No, I'm all good. Thank you, Professor. All right. See you, Nora. Have a good class. Or actually, you already did your lab, right? Um. Well, I wasn't in lab today because I couldn't drive because I got in an accident. <laughs> I don't mm. have a car anymore. So. Are you okay with from your accident? I, I saw that you mentioned that. Yeah, no, I'm okay. I'm just a little upset because I need my car. <laughs> that would but, come in handy, wouldn't it? Yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, good luck. And I'm sorry that happened to you. And mm -hmm. I will speak with you guys Wednesday. Sounds good. Thank you, Professor. Have a good night.
Thank you, you too. Bye-bye.